Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I am on the board of the USA chapter for the International Humanistic Management Association, USA chapter. And I am also the founder of Humanist Learning Systems and one of the co-hosts for this Lunch and Learn uh, series. Elizabeth is my co-host. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, good, good to see everyone. Um, I'm Elizabeth Castillo at California State University, San Bernardino. I'm the president of the U.S. chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association, and we are so happy you're here today. Thank you for joining us. Wonderful. Our guest today, I have been wanting Craig on for a really long time, <laughs> and he finally said yes. So um, Dr. Craig Nathanson is an educator, author, speaker, and coach for midlife development, he is the creator of the humanistic leadership model and the joyful work model and as a new way to better lead oneself and others positively and sustainably. He has a PhD in human and organizational systems, an MA in human development, and an MS in telecommunications management. He has taught on-site and online graduate undergraduate programs since 2001 at several universities in North America, Europe, China, and Vietnam. So welcome, Craig. Thank you so much, Jennifer. By the way, it's great to, to see a lot of you. My Most of my students on Zoom tend to keep their cameras off. And, you know, I feel like I'm speaking to myself. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's an honor for me to be here and speak, speak to you um, and, to, and to take questions. I, I'm going to talk just for a few minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, about a few ideas. And then, you know, we'll open it up for, for, for discussion. Anyway, thank you all for for the time today. Um, so people often ask me, you know, uh, what is what is this thing called humanistic leadership? And, and more importantly, why is it essential? So, so back in 2015, after, you know, a long corporate senior management tour, 20 plus years, and then another 23 years of, you know, uh, teaching around the world, don't do the math on that, by the way. Um, back in 2015, I I started to, to get concerned. There was a lot of my students were always confused between the differences between leadership and management. And of course, they seldom mentioned the idea of coaching. So, uh, you know, I, after doing some research, I realized there hadn't been really a new leadership kind of theory that's come out in, you know, 25 years or so. And so I decided to, to come up with a new model really for myself and to be able to explain to my students, you know, at a fundamental level that... <laughs> You know, the difference is between leading, which is the vision, selling the tickets for the journey, uh, management, which is driving the bus, you know, all those things of management, goal setting, measuring, performance, review, and, you know, making sure people get to where they need to go. And then, of course, coaching, which is the support, you know, giving people on the bus what, what they need to get to the final destination in good shape. So I, I started with that. But then I, I started to think deeper. And I thought to myself, the world's in in tough shape. We have lots of issues. We'll leave it at that. And I felt like, you know, the way we have either, you know, I have four kids, but, and I tried my best, you know, they're all grown now, but you know, the way we parent, the way we lead ourselves, the way we lead others, the way we, you know, teach our students, uh, lead our communities, nations, and the world. I thought, you know, where has it really gotten us in the last 200 years? You know, humans have been around about 200,000 years. And it seems like, it seemed like to me at the time that it was only getting worse. And so, I thought, wow, I feel kind of a sense of urgency now about sustainability. So this was back in 2015. So I started writing about humanistic leadership. I published a book called The Best Manager. You know, it was, now that I look back, that was book was kind of primitive because it didn't have you know, any of my current thinking. But at the time, if you typed into Google humanistic leadership, you, know, you saw my work, you saw other people's work, but there wasn't, wasn't much out there. And then, you know, we had the pandemic in 2020. And I thought to myself, if there ever was a time for us to come together as a humanity with a common problem to fix, you know, if there's anything good that would come out of the, the pandemic, it would be it would be that. And for a while, it worked. We all stayed home. We all reflected on our lives. We looked at what was important. And of course, here we are in 2023. And as usual, as human behavior is, we've all gone back to our old our old ways of being. And, and so so thus, I have a, I, I don't know how to say it, I have a greater sense of urgency than ever before, that we we need a new way forward in how we lead ourselves and others, if if seriously, we want to be sustainable. I tell this to my 19-year-old students at University of San Francisco, and, you know, they have this, like, <laughs> this expression on their face, 
Um, but the new generations, you know, G Gen Z, millennials who are now becoming managers for the first time in their 30s, you know, they're they get it. You know, they grew up on their phones. They grew up through collaboration. Um, they get it. And so I think I think the world is ready for humanistic leadership. So I know through all of our work here, of course, you know, we're, you know, we're trying to do that. So um, to me, humanistic leadership is a mindset. It's it's not a theory. It's a mindset. It's a way of being in the world. Um, what is it? It's about being empathetic towards people. It's working in harmony. It's working collectively. Like in the United States, it's difficult for us because we're an individualistic society. You know, we kind of look at our own, try to optimize ourselves and suboptimize everyone else. Uh, Asian cultures are much better where I teach a lot in, in being collective. But, you know, we need to be collective. And I think that's part of humanistic leadership to, to, to build harmony and positive, you know, positive relationships. So this, you know, this is the focus of my life's work. So I created this model, a humanistic leadership model, as a as a structure, as kind of a holistic structure, a model to kind of think about how I go about doing this. And that's that's really the next question I get is, okay, this is fine, Craig, but how, how do I really do this? So the humanistic leadership model has four levels, and I think I'll just touch on the first three levels at the moment, and then we can kind of open this up. The, so the first level deals with self-awareness. I think it's very difficult uh, to lead other people if you can't lead yourself. And most of us are not self-aware because unless we had enlightened parents or we had an enlightened professor, um, or unless, as for my research on joyful work, I've written books on this subject. This is another one of the areas of my life that I spend helping people find joyful work because I also think the world would be a better place if we all do what we love. But, you know, unless you're between 35 and 45, you know, people between 35 and 45 tend to have one of five things happen to them, a, a relationship issue, uh, uh, you know, a financial issue, an illness, a job layoff, or for about 80 percent of the people in my research between 35 and 45, we go to bed at night with angst. We lay there and we think to ourselves, I was busy today, but but doing what? <laughs> and And, you know, did I make a difference in the world? And and is this what the rest of my life will, will look like? And so there's an opportunity for all of us in the middle part of our lives to not have a midlife crisis, as the literature calls for, <laughs> but a midlife crusade and to rewrite a new chapter of our lives. But you're never too old, never too young for this. So the, the bottom line is most of us are not self-aware. Uh, so what does it mean to become self-aware? Because I, I think that's a prerequisite for humanistic leadership. Uh, well, in short, I mean, I have a lot of ideas on this, but I think it starts with purpose, you know. You know, what is the purpose of your life? And if, if if I heard this in my 20s, it would be so esoteric, I wouldn't know what to do with this. But really what it means is, and I, and I ask all of you on this call, you know, uh, where is your energy right now? Where do you want to make a difference? You know, where do you want to make a difference in the world? I think it starts with that. If I was to take all of you on a field trip to uh, a physical bookstore, and, you know, they don't really exist anymore, um, for two hours, you know, what what part of the bookstore would you go to? And we tend to go to different parts of the bookstore, metaphorically speaking, uh, during different times of our lives. So, you know, where is your energy right now? So, you know, plant that seed. Where is your, where, you know, where is your energy? Where is your purpose? And then aligning purpose to values. We all know this is so important, but, you know, wh what's most important to you? What are the three to five things that are most important to you in your life? And how do you know if you're following them? Uh, and how do you know if you're not? I call that operating rules. You know, if you don't write down, well, family is most important to me, and here's what I would have to do today to, to be true to those values, and here's what I would have to do to not follow those values. So I think aligning values is important. For my research, most people spend most of their day doing things that have nothing to do with their core values, and then they wonder why they have you know angst late at night as they're trying to fall asleep. So I think part of being self-aware is, is aligning values, purpose, and you know if you figured out your values, you could back into your purpose a bit, and vice versa. Uh, you know, we all need goals in life, you know, uh, so, and, and I think, you know, aligning your long-term goals, your medium-term goals, your short-term goals to your values can really give you a personal roadmap for your life. So when we have a personal roadmap, an authentic roadmap for our life, we tend to be very self-aware and therefore we tend to be very self-aware with others. Uh, I also think part of being self-aware is, um, is being humble, having humility, you know, before age 30, it's important to build what's called ego. Uh, ego gives us a sense of social identity, so self-esteem. You know, if you go to a party and you're under 30 and someone says, you know, hey, what's up? What do you do? You answer with your job title. 
and the other person tells you their job title and everybody walks away happy. But after 30, some of you may already know this, of course, you go to a party and someone asks you what you do, you talk about who you are versus what you do because no one could take away who you are uh, versus, but you know, anybody could take away, you know, what you do. So I think it's important, um, especially as we get over 30, it's never too late, never too early to, to be humble, to have, to have humility. I think also having tolerance. Um, I also think for my research, I don't believe it's possible to remove our bias. We all have them from our collective history, but I think part of being, uh, part of being self-aware is understanding our biases. You know, what is it? Where do they come from? Understanding it and then working really hard to minimize the bias so it doesn't get in the way of our relationships with people. When I teach my students the topic of diversity, I, I focus on just two words, two very important words, inclusion and appreciation. You know, how can we all include and appreciate people who are different than us? Uh, and I, again, if we could just do that, the world would be a better place. So these are all, you know, examples of, of self-awareness, you know, being calm, being a person of integrity, being op optimistic. 23 years ago, I left corporate America, gave it all up and walked out the door. And it was very risky, very, took a lot of courage, but I've never looked back. And I think part of being self-aware is, in fact, having the courage to, to kind of pave an authentic life that makes a difference to you and others. In, in the chat, or I received some of the questions for this session today. Someone had asked, where, uh, you know, where, does, where does ethics fit in? It absolutely fits in here, in self-awareness. I think um, what I try to tell, teach and tell people is that, you know, do my actions you know, make a positive difference to other people and, and society? And if they do, then I think you're an ethical person. If not, well, then I think you have to question that. So I, I think, uh, you know, I think part of being, you know, eth ethics fits in right here. All right. So so let's let's say you've done a really good job of becoming self-aware, which is a lifelong process. But let's say uh, you feel pretty good about that. You, you've run into people where you talk to them and they're really looking at you. They're centered. They're focused. That tends to, to mean they're pretty self-aware. And of course, we've run into people who we start talking to before we know it. They start talking about themselves and, you know, how that conversation goes. So. I think, I think before leading other people, we have to be able to lead ourselves. The second tier of the model uh, is systems thinking. Now, systems thinking is, in fact, a theory. Uh, we don't really think about this too much. But to be a systems thinking thinker is to understand that, you know, everything is connected in the world. You know, um, and I think to be a humanistic leader, you have to have high levels of conscientiousness. That's one of the personality traits. If you're high in conscientiousness, you think before speaking. You think before you behave. You think about, there's a, a term in systems thinking called unintended consequences. So in other words, every time we take, make a decision or you know, we act out or say something, it, things will occur that we didn't expect. And so as a humanistic leader, you must be a systems thinker. You must understand that everything in life is a system. Our body is a system. Um, you know, your family unit is a system. Society is a system. Our organizations are systems. And a systems thinker must always be looking at the system. How is the system performing? Where is it embryonic? Where is it mature? Where are there broken links? It's very important to, one of the most important things of a, of a leader, humanistic leader, aside from enabling joy at work, <laughs> and that's, I think, the most important thing to measure at work, the amount of joy that people have, it's another topic, uh, is in fact to, to monitor and, and measure the system. The structure of any system, you all probably know this, of course, will determine the, the behavior of those who work within the system. So this is really important also is to understand that the structures that we set up, you know, will, will of course, influence and enable the behavior. A part of being a system thinker is, is to do what I call synthesis versus analysis. You know, when we just do analysis, we're just looking at discrete pieces of data. But synthesis is looking at everything in the system and seeing how they fit. I'll give you an example. You know, for 20 years before the pandemic, as a professor, I would do what most professors do in the physical classroom before Zoom. I would come in with my PowerPoint slides. And I always thought I was a pretty passionate, pretty good teacher. But, you know, I just put up my slides for the benefit of the students. It wasn't for me. I, I knew what I was speaking about. And it always occurred to me that students didn't listen as well. They always would just stare at the slides and be writing as quickly as possible <laughs> the notes. And I always thought, why don't, why don't you just bring the slides to class? So during the pandemic, you know, I, I'm a systems thinker and, you know, like all of us, we were home, we, we had less, more time on our hands. I thought, how could I improve my teaching? So I decided 
I would I would never never again use PowerPoint slides in the classroom. I would record all my lectures in advance, you know, and give them to students in advance. They could look at look at the lectures and the PowerPoint slides whenever they want. And instead, I would just talk to students. And that's how I've been teaching ever since the last three years. You know, we just talk. Of course, I have them do breakout groups and, and so on. But students have said they've, uh, you know, uh, enjoyed the teaching that much more. Their learning is deeper. And I, of course, have really, really, really uh, loved my teaching even more. Just just like now, I could have done a PowerPoint presentation now, but um, which at first felt more secure, right? But in the end, this is what I this is what I love to do. So that's an example. As a systems thinker, you're you're always trying to figure out how to do synthesis. Where are things not working, and how could you, you know, how could you fix them? The, the, and lastly, before I open it up for questions, the, the last tier. Well, there's four tiers. I guess I should explain those. The third tier uh, is is to be humanistic, and this is a topic that all of you, of course, of course, understand. What does it mean to me to be humanistic? To treat people with kindness. Um, to treat People at work, especially as partners, I don't like to work in uh, the word employees. I never did. Treat people as partners, as equal partners. Um, show empathy, be ethical, have compassion, have integrity, all of those things. Most importantly, participate as a collective whole. I think that's an important part of being humanistic um, so that your actions you know, make the world a better place. And hopefully if you've done enough self-awareness, you, you'll, you'll, feel, you'll feel that. Now, I, I talk about humanistic leadership in the, in the HLM model as putting people over profit. And I do believe that's important. Uh, of course, to make money in, in business, to be profitable. I mean, pro you have to be profitable to stay in business. But the issue is how, how do you become profitable? By, by running over people or working with people. But often when I start, I start my talk with, you know, humanistic leadership is putting people over profit. You know, the eyes start to roll from, from the CEOs. And so lately I've been kind of, uh, I have a, a placeholder tagline instead, although I still talk about the importance of people over profit. And the tagline is humanistic leadership, sustainability with people. And so far, no one's argued about the idea of sustainability. So maybe this will open up, open up more eyes. Um, an example, I like to give examples. You know, years ago, I had a woman who worked for me. She was an IT programmer. Her husband died of cancer. She was gone for two weeks. I knew she loved to work in the garden. And when she came back uh, to work, I didn't let her come to work. I sent her to a two-day class on how to work in the garden. I didn't tell HR, of course. And, you know, it just seemed like the natural thing to do. Now, that caused me issues at work. I had to backfill her position and so on. But when she came back to work, you know, she was still sad, of course, but she felt like, wow, somebody really cared about me. It's the little things we do at work that are most important. I am sorry. You, you really helped me. Thank you. Uh, our team wouldn't be the same without you. You're a valuable member of the team. Those things are more, are so, are so important. So in conclusion, well, before I conclude, the last tier, by the way, just 30 seconds on this, of the HLM model. To the left side is leading, managing, and coaching. They're all important, like I said earlier, but they all have to come from the same person. I, I, I will get, I'm sure, questions about where does the, you know, reward and punishment and blah, 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 where does it all come in? Well, you know, the management part has to happen. But I don't believe in reward and punishment, so we could we could talk about that. Um, so leading, managing, coaching. Uh, the middle of the model talks about leadership styles. You know, we all have different styles that we like to lead people. Some of us are more servant oriented. Some are some are autocratic. Some of us, although I don't recommend that. Some are you know task focused, structure focused. You know, principled centered, and so on. So uh, I think leadership behavior styles is important to lead people in ways that get positive results. And then the last part of this last tier is personality traits. I think there are, you know, personality traits such as high emotional stability, you know, sociability, high conscientious, being being open, <laughs> and so on, uh, are, are good traits to. I mean, it's, personality is wired it's from birth. As far as we know, it's very hard to change your personality, but you can you can modify your behavior. And so I think there's aspects of personality traits that humanistic leaders can have. So. In summary, I, I believe very strongly and I have a sense of urgency that we need a new way forward in terms of how we lead ourselves and others. And this is this is what I'm going with as just a way to talk talk about this. Um, so that's that's all I got. I'm happy to collaborate and answer really any and all 
all questions. I could talk for hours, so I'm going to stop. Sorry, Jennifer, that was more than 15 minutes. Oh, that's fine. Um, it was great. And I think you're, um, I want to thank you for that. It always amazes me. It doesn't amaze me. It amazes me, but doesn't amaze me. When we have people to come on, talk about humanism, um, they're all talking about the same thing and using slightly different words to describe it, to get at slightly different nuances in it. Like the, the question of what does it mean to be a good human being? It really has like consistency with nuance. Right. And so I loved your presentation because I'm like, that's a really neat way to describe what I talk about this other way. Right. Mm -hmm. I think probably everybody in the audience is, is having that same response. Now, the way you closed, though, brought up some of the questions we got in the pre-questions. And that has to do with, um, you know, some people were like, well, how how does a leadership team decide on what leadership model to use? Because a lot of these leadership models do in fact get to the same place, right? And you mentioned servant leadership uh, versus autocratic, which I think probably everybody here is like recoils from. <laughs> um, but can you talk a little bit about those models? And because it seems like your model incorporates the freedom of those other ways of leading. Mm -hmm. I hope yeah. that was coherent. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, I use the model as just a way to to, to structure the discussion. Um, I want people to walk away thinking, well, I guess I should become self-aware before I start to lead other people. And this idea of systems thinking, yeah, hmm, how could I practice that in my daily life? And what does it mean to be humanistic? And you know, what are the differences between leading and managing, coaching, and so on? So, and what are my leadership styles? And you know, how does personality deal, so, deal with this? So all of those things are things to consider Versus, you know, uh, a CEO sitting around the table with his or her team saying, okay, which, which, which leadership style, you know, uh, approach are we going to use here? We're going to be trans, you know, tra transformational, servant oriented, etc. I think it's, it, uh, for example, I just gave, you know, I'm in the process of giving workshops for companies under 200 people. And if they take my workshop, I, I certify them, give them the logo to put on their website as being humanistic, just to kind of you know, spread these ideas. And and one CEO said to me a couple of weeks ago, you know, this might help us with retention. It might help us with recruitment because now we're talking about that we care about people. So it's really about having a, a discussion about, you know, how, what is our philosophy here about how we work with people? More so than, you know, we're going to use this theory or that theory or this approach. I wouldn't want anybody. That That's why I struggled with, I don't want to certify any company that they're humanistic. You know, I can't control that. But what I can do is, is you know, teach these ideals, the, this this mindset. So I don't know if that answers your question. It, it does, actually. I think that's very helpful, which, you know, leads me to my next question, which is about how does this work in real life? Um, one of the questions we've got is, what are the leadership difficulties you face and how have you tackled those problems using these principles? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in, in my career as a, as a senior manager, as all of you, I'm sure, have been in senior management positions, day in and day out, especially in a public capitalistic company, you know, we're we're you know we're asked to to do certain things, and 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 we have to figure out how whether we agree or not how to implement those ideas through our people. In 25 years of leading people, I I never saw in any performance review that Craig was a great developer of people. I only saw whether my team met our objectives or not. If we did, I got rewarded. If not, we, you know, we got punished. So the, so the thing I want to say is that to be a humanistic leader of other people, you must do if you want good business results, but you'll never get credit. So the thing you must do, you will never get credit for, but you must do it because you realize as a humanistic leader, it's the day in and day out ways that you treat and talk and communicate to people that's going to get those results. Um, this leads into my other body of work, joyful work. If people enjoy their work, for my research, all other business indicators go up. And so, um, yeah, I can give you hundreds of of examples, but it's they're no different than any of your examples who have ever managed a team of people. You have outside pressures. You you know you have the usual. I mean, in a capitalistic society, we are short term driven. In some ways, I don't know if I should say this. In some ways, it's probably against the law. You know, in certain countries to be humanistic because the focus is on short-term profit and the CEO will get sued by its, by its shareholders 
if you know if it looks like anything else is going on i'm serious about that so that's why i say that as a humanistic leader it's it's the little things that you do that you no one will notice except your people and you you won't get credit for so don't expect to get a bonus for this however it will lead to positive results and a positive impact on society i don't know if that makes sense Wonderful. Okay, I have one last question for you, but I want to let everybody know if you've got questions, please write them down in the chat um, so that we can ask them on your behalf. We won't be opening up the mic for anybody. Um, so if you've got a question, please put it in the chat and we'll be reading them for you. So Craig, my last question you just touched on <laughs> for me, so it's a good fit in, has to do with, um, you know, how do you implement this culturally? Right. Um, because you obviously work in China, you work around the world, you work in Vietnam. How does the humanistic, your humanistic approach, um, and the convert philosophic conversations you're having around leadership and management and coaching, how does that manifest in with cultural differences or does it? Well, it does. I, I think when you when you work with people in a different culture, you have to adapt to the way to their norms and how they operate. When I first started, for example, teaching in China 18 years ago, um, it, 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 I didn't understand why my students would never ask questions. Um, I didn't understand why it was just me talking. I, I'd try to, you know, teach the way I taught in America and it didn't work. And then, you know, quickly I realized that, you know, uh, Asian culture is collective. They like to work on their own. It's important to save face, not cause people to, to be, uh, you know, um, to, to feel humiliated and so on. And so I quickly learned that the best way to work with my Chinese students was to have them work in groups and they select someone who makes a report out and, and so on. And so over the years, I've learned to work wonderfully with, with my Asian groups in Vietnam and China and other Asian countries. And but anyway, what I learned was that, for example, Asian countries are, are, are much more ready. I mean, Asian countries have been practicing, on one hand, humanistic leadership you know, for thousands of years because they tend to be collective. On the other hand, I must say that in many Asian cultures, historically, the, the managers that are probably in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s have been autocratic. It's just, it's just been, you know, uh, part of the culture to, to be tops down. But, the, but it's changing. I have to tell you, the older managers in Asia are realizing that the younger generation has grown up through collaboration. And yes, the younger generation still wants, you know, rewards and wants to be promoted and so on, but they're looking even though they can't explain this totally, they're looking for meaning at work. And you know, if you if I'm 22 and you can't help me understand how I'm gonna you know find meaning in my work and joyful work and so on, I'm gonna go somewhere else. So I think I think the older, for example, Asian autocratic managers are are realizing that they must change if they want to retain and recruit. Many years ago, I I uh, I gave several workshops in China for the government. Uh, because the 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 managers are very interested in learning, um, uh, well, I, I'll say Western ways, but let's just say humanistic ways. Um, I you know I'm teaching online now uh, two MBA classes in China, and the focus is on humanistic leadership. Um, I'll be in Vietnam next spring in China doing the same thing. So, so anyway, two things: uh, you have to adapt to the cultures that you're working with. And number two, I have been pleasantly surprised that in, in uh, for example, in, in Asia, the, the people are really receptive to, to, to new ideas, even though, um, you know, the cultures might be different. And I've taught in Eastern Europe and, and I teach in England and I, you know, I could give similar examples. Thank you so much for that. I know when I go places, one of the things I try to do is understand the local, the the ph major philosophies of the area and tie what I'm talking about to the principles that mm -hmm. are, are majorly dominant in whatever that community is. So mm -hmm. Elizabeth, I'm seeing that we have a lot of questions coming up. So take it away. We do. So we'll turn to the first one and from Dr. Laila Alanazi. Um, I asked this before, but I'm interested to know whether this model has been tested. Um, have you been collecting data or publishing your results somewhere? You know, I, I've been, I've been, um, no, I have been too busy teaching and I have been writing lots of popular articles. I have not, I mean, I have one academic article that was published by Excelsior College where, where I teach 
but I, I would call it more of a popular article than, you know, than a serious academic article. I would love to do that, but I just have not, unfortunately, had the time. So as far as testing it, no, I don't have empirical data at this point, but uh, my intuition tells me it it, uh, it makes sense. It does work. Uh, the only data I have is from, you know, several thousand students over the past four or five years who have said this makes sense. I have a lot of those students, you know, calling, you know, I think I've been teaching these ideas for 20 years, even though back you know, 15 years ago, I didn't call it humanistic leadership. Um, so the 20, 20 year olds that I taught 20 years ago are now 40 and they're calling me up to, to work with their organizations now that they're managers. So I, I would say based on the response I get, it, it I haven't seen anybody like, like, I, you know, I when I give talks on joyful work, there's always somebody in the back of the room that goes, so you're the person that's going to help me enjoy my work, huh? <laughs> you know, like it's my fault. But 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 uh, with humanistic leadership, I, I haven't had anybody react negatively like, oh, this is a stupid idea. So uh, unfortunately, no, I don't have any empirical research, but I, I this is one of those things where uh, I just think it makes sense. Well, it sounds like it's ripe for the next taking it to the next step. I mean, yeah. that you have the conceptual uh, layout. So now it would be just, you know, setting up a way to get it tested um so maybe our forum here uh, could be a, a helpful thing i would love to publish something with with some of you on this absolutely absolutely to pair up with three or four people since i don't have the time to collaborate absolutely so make a note of that yeah well we actually do have writing groups that get together and on topics so we'll definitely and for other people if you're interested as well you know um reach out to us because that is one of the things that ima does good i appreciate the question yeah. Um, so the next one, um, what does the term sustainability mean uh, in concrete terms and how do we operationalize it? And that's from Bruce at Lehigh University. Well, I think you have to look at it on an individual level. You know, I won't tell you my age, but, you know, I want to be doing what I'm doing for the next 30 or 40 years at the same level, at the same energy. Uh, I do what I love all day long and I, I feel much younger. I have more energy than ever before. And I think I'm keeping myself sustainable uh, you know, by doing what I love and focusing on things like this that are very important to me. So I think at an individual level, you know, we all have to get get rest and eat well and exercise, but more importantly, spend most of our lives doing things that are authentic to ourselves. So that's what it means to me on an individual level. And and I you know I teach people a roadmap on how to do that with their joyful work, different topic. On an organizational level, um, look, I, I don't need to to sugarcoat this. I mean, if you look around the world, a lot of our organizational models are falling apart um, th through greed and geopolitics and and um, the fact that we, you know, we're not, we're not, we're just, you know, we're, we're continuing to pull resources from the earth, but we're not putting anything back in. You know, when we're pulling up coal, it's a million years old and expecting us to be sustainable. I think we're fooling ourselves. It's a different topic. Um, so I think organizationally, um, you know, uh, you know, there are a lot of com companies that continue to be very profitable, but there's a lot of companies that have struggled since COVID. I think I think the real answer is we have a new generation of workers. For example, in the U.S., over 40 percent of the workers are uh, under 35 years old and they grew up with just different ideals, even though they were uh, raised by Gen, Gen X parents who were very reward and punishment oriented. Uh, but kids who grew up under the boomers like me, the millennials, I think, you know, I think they're ready for change so how you know i think i think it's time to operate opera uh you know to make this uh operational if you will i would say i so from my view uh yes there are a lot of companies that have made a lot of money and developed a lot of products and you know all of that but if i look at humanity if i look at the big picture you know many experts have said and this isn't me that you know our species you know could be extinct in 50 or 60 years i don't know about you that's pretty that's pretty scary to me and, and I could see that and we could all see that. And you know what I'm talking about. So I think it's time for, for a new way forward. And the, the best way to operate, operate you know, to make this, to make this, to implement this is to be, to be humanistic, <laughs> to start today. That's all. That was a big ramble. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Yeah, no, and I really love that you brought it. Uh, so often sustainability seems like concept out there, right? Versus like we've got to live it and enact it. So uh, that's terrific. Um, Ravi Chitna has a question. How do you reconcile diametrically opposing positions that cannot be reconciled? Uh, for example, current warring parties in Ukraine and Gaza. Well, I, I think if, if, 
Yeah, that's a tough question. I, you know, I want to I want to go straight to I think I think peace is the only solution. And I think the 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 tenets, the principles of humanistic leadership can solve problems like that. But we have to be willing to do that. Um, you know, when there's thousands of years of history, it's you know, we haven't solved that yet. But I, I think I think, you know, as leaders of any party, uh, internalize what it means to be humanistic and to be collective. You know, those people have to step forward. It takes it takes two to dance, right? So I th I think I think everything that we're talking about here can can be used absolutely to prevent war, to prevent conflicts like we see all over the world right now. Um, but it 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 takes it takes courage. It takes it takes people willing to um, to kind of put their I I you know their their positions aside and be willing to to, to try a new approach. Uh, we. Um, we have no choice, you know, but we have to we have to find one common denominator, which is we all live on this place called Earth. And, you know, we're not treating it very well and we're not treating each other very well. And so without getting into politics, of course, and I'm certainly not qualified to do that. I do think that humanistic leadership is the way I don't see much of that in the world right now. I will say that. And it, it uh, every morning I wake up, I look for something new and I don't see anything. And this gives me more of a sense of urgency. Hmm. I, I want to follow up with that if I can and kind of bring the question back to a more mundane um, workplace problem. And that is that even if you are practicing self-awareness, even if you are practicing, um, you know, uh, systems thinking and whatnot, you're still going to come across people who are not, <laughs> you know, right. so how does uh, someone who is practicing humanistic leadership and self-leadership um, how does that help us deal with, mm -hmm. say, a psychopath or mm -hmm. a bully in the workplace or someone yeah. who's very authoritarian in the workplace? Um, because these are real problems that we get. You know, everybody wants to know, OK, I want to do this, but what about the people who don't and how do I interact with them? You know, I, I teach a conflict on I teach a workshop on conflict. And what I like to suggest is we, we all come to work with these little bubbles above our heads, you know, and, and they all have they all represent our concerns and problems that we bring from home. And a lot of us come to the work environment expecting that the organization you know, will solve all of our problems. And when they don't, the potential for conflict is high. You know, anytime you have more than one person, the potential for conflict is there. And so I think the best thing that you can do when you run into a person at work who doesn't necessarily have these ideals is to have a pleasing personality. Uh, I mean, you be the person that compromises, that smiles, the most muscles we have in our face, I think they're like 60 or so, and we don't use them very much. You know, uh, you you don't have to be defensive. You try to go for win-win solutions. You you have a pleasing personality. You're friendly. You listen. You ask questions. And you smile. It's very hard to have a com conflict with a person who's like that. So I think that's all you can do. We can, As I told one of my students the other day, we cannot make people become self-aware. This is on them, but don't ever give up coaching because I think when trust is in place, people are more open to coaching. But when you run into those people, I think that's all you can do. Uh, you, you can't change them. People have to change themselves. Okay, um, our next question is from Killing Gun Raj. Um, how to generate or maintain the mindset of doing good and positive things without getting credits externally? So there's a difference between internal motivation and external motivation. You know, those of us, and most of us are externally motivated because that's the systems that we grew up under based on B.F. Skinner's uh, uh, experiments with animals. I'll just leave it at that. And, and you know, it's nothing wrong with, you know, uh, a reward or someone says, I love you, or here's a hundred dollars or, you, you know, pat on the back. But the problem is when we're just waiting for that, often we're not going to get an external reward and, and we're going to feel disappointed and, and feel bad about ourselves. It's much better, it's much better to develop internal motivation, which will last a lifetime. From my research, I don't think it's possible to motivate people, so we shouldn't try. Uh, we can, through the threat of punishment and the promise of reward, we can nudge people a little bit, motivate people a little bit short term, but eventually they'll, you know, they'll fall off the cliff. So I think I think another key aspect of humanistic leadership is teaching people how to motivate themselves, which will last you know, which will last a lifetime. And too many of our systems, which I, I have to admit, 
you know, like 40% of Fortune 500 companies in the U.S. are now getting rid of the performance reviews, which, you know, I've been writing about for years, how, how, uh, how that defeats morale in the organization. So I'm happy to see that the ways we work collaboratively is starting to replace the, you know, the old, some of the old, you know, uh, <laughs> motivational schemes. But I think we have to develop and teach people how to motivate themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, internal motivation is abundant. You, like all of you have the uh, ability right this moment to be inherently happy, to motivate yourself. It's all internal. There's there's plenty for everyone, but we have to teach people how to do that because we grew up in school and in our systems focused on you know some external reward. Yeah, or thinking that ha uh, happiness is an external uh, condition versus an internal desire. Um, okay, well, thank you for, uh, for that. Um, now, Anil Maheshwarishi has a question. I agree that self-awareness is the key first step. From deep self-awareness can come dharma or purpose or calling. Mm -hmm. um, that, that can lead to joyful work. How does one develop self-awareness as a leader? It, it's the things I talked about earlier. It's figuring out it's figuring out the things I talked about earlier. And what is what is your purpose in life? You know, where do you want to make a difference? And how do you do that? What does that look like? You know, how do you operationalize that? What are your values? You know, creating a roadmap for your life. The, the One of the models I created is called the joyful work model. And there's five stages. And the, the first stage is the treadmill. Most of us spend our lives on the treadmill. You know, we're on it because we want to get in good shape, but none of us really like it. And, and many times this is what work can feel like, the treadmill. And sometimes you fall off the treadmill. Maybe somebody attractive you know, walks by and you look and you fall off. In life, we, and I call that, the stage four, which is a trigger event. We all have things in life that cause us to be temporarily uncomfortable. It could be a death. It could be just, you know, you don't feel good that day. Whenever you have a trigger event in life, it's important not to go back to the treadmill, but to move forward to the third stage, which is, which is reflection. And so I think when we reflect, that is the opportunity, whether it takes a day, a month, a year or more to build a new roadmap for your life. If we can reflect and move forward, then we go to the second stage, which I call change. And then change leads to a new beginning. I've never met anyone that got to Dharma, got to a new beginning and said, eh, I'll just go back to the, the, tre the treadmill. So this is what I teach in terms of the joyful work model. And I think, uh, again, I think the most important business indicator that any leader can measure is the amount of joy that people have at work. And people will say to me, well, you can't do that. How, how can you do that? It's actually quite simple. You ask people, do you enjoy your work? Yes or no? And be willing to support them based on their answer. Same thing is with motivation. You know, what motivates you and why? And as a leader, be prepared to do something with their answer. If there's trust built up over time, people will answer. So. Um, and that your uh, response brought up something that I'd like to ask about, and that is um, values. Uh, what is your um, experience with your students being in touch or aware of their values or people in the workplace? I just did a values exercise with my class. I'm teaching freshmen this year, and I was kind of shocked. I mean, it, like it didn't occur to some of them that they even had values. Um, and so I was wondering, is that yeah. a California thing or is it, um, you know, in, in your experience and maybe in the audience, you could type in in the chat what your experience, you know, teaching values is too. Yeah, I think if you're deeply religious, you may have had more experience with this. But in general, I think people don't understand values. I, I try to teach that values are end states, E-N-D, you know. So if you say I value money, really? Do you value independence? OK, then one of your values is independence. But it's really, it's really thinking deeply. It's, it's a long exercise. I t t take my students through, and when they're through, they feel, they feel pretty excited. Like, wow! I guess I, I tell people to be selfish. You know, be really selfish because unless you're following your values, you're, you know, no one around you is going to be happy. So I think we have to teach people what it, you know, what is, what is most important to you, and and, and most importantly, how do you know if you're following it? I could say that health is really important, but you know, I have a. I don't exercise, I don't sleep well, I don't have a good diet. And then, you know, that's why I'm not following my value. So, uh, no, I don't think people are that that much aware of their values. Um, we're all too busy, especially with, you know, the internet. We're all scrolling. We got to go back to some some basics. But I, 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 no, I don't think people are aware of their values. I think they need help. Okay, maybe that's another leadership intervention point then, huh? Part of that self-awareness uh, piece of it. That's why it's um, on the top of the tier, yeah. 
Um, and then um, Anil Maharishi said, um, I also agree that collective thinking can facilitate dignity and group action, but can also lead to higher power distance and autocracy. Uh, yet some of the most resources and power and success uh, resides with individualistic countries. Um, how do you reconcile that? So I don't have a good answer. That's an excellent, that's an excellent question. I, I guess it depends how you measure success in a culture. Um, I mean, individually, I, I like to tell people that, you know, your, your measure of success should be getting to your goals on time. I think for a culture, for an organization, um, it's the same. I think for a country, um, I think it's the same, but I think it's also looking at, you know, greater, greater earth, greater society and saying, you know, how, um, you know, is it, whether it's a, a nation, uh, a, a company, a classroom, an individual, again, you have to ask yourself, you know, if does getting to my goals on time help or hurt other people um, or society? And I, and that's a tough one. And it, I think if the answer is it, it's not helping, then I think those you're optimizing yourself, but you're sub optimizing everybody else. So I think there is a way to work, for example, collectively and yet in a, hu in a human, humanistic way. I, I absolutely think that's true. So I, I don't know. I, I, I can't wrap my head around who's better, who's worse uh, based on um, individualism or collectivism. All I can tell you is I step back, I look at the world today, we're in big trouble and we're not sustainable for all, all the reasons from, you know, somebody could push a button tomorrow. We all know what I'm speaking about and we're all gone. And if, if we're that close, if the atomic clock from 1940 is now at like, I don't know, 15 seconds to midnight, uh, okay, then we, we need a new way forward. So I, I just rise to the top and says, okay, I don't know how to deal with that question, but I could tell you as a humanity, um, we're in big trouble. And uh, I hope I'm wrong, but you know, we got to try something. And you know, everybody has to make a debt in the world. This is my debt in the world, humanistic leadership, trying to influence people, maybe somewhere, somewhere, this will make a difference. I don't know. Right. And I hope just, that there is a possible for another way. I'm sorry, Jen. Yeah, I was just going to jump in. Um, one of the concepts I like for that, this, this, this part of the discussion is the idea of embedded autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. I think individuality versus collectivism is a false dichotomy. It can, we can, we can, and should be doing both yeah. simultaneously, right? It's not either or it's both and. And so I like the concept of embedded autonomy as a way to kind of encapsulate, we have to both protect the individual dignity and work collectively. I'm that is like the human, yeah. like that's how human tribes have always managed mm -hmm. to like survive. So. Okay. Um, and uh, Sweat had said um, there is an, e an email, someone who might be interested in partnering um, on research. So I'll, I'll, we'll send the uh, chat out afterwards. Um, and then Marty uh, Schumacher said, youth coming from the social justice narratives in university <clears throat> are very sensitive to preventing microaggressions, uh, which are very subjective and can be defined as uh, you just hurt my feelings. How do you discuss this new trend of what Jonathan Haidt calls coddling of American youth to face their fears in the workplace in the humanistic leadership model. Mm. I, I try to raise up the conversation to inclusion and appreciation. How could you include and in, 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 in appreciate people who are different than you? Young people are afraid to speak in person because they grew up on their phones. They much rather text. And I tell my students, you must have a voice in the world, but just make sure it's respectful. And then I teach them about, you know, conscientiousness and being, you know, being a systems thinker and so on. So with those skills, I think our, our youth can start to, to speak out more their opinions and feel good about it, but in respectful ways. And then a lot of the, the perceived hurts and microaggressions and, and, and um, you know, I'm just going to stay in my shell. I think over time that will start to change. But that is a generational challenge right now. And it got worse because of COVID, right? All, all our, our youth... Um, <laughs> Instead of working on those things, they they stayed home more, you know. So I think it's it's a huge challenge. But I again, through humanistic leadership, I think we could help everyone. Um, just real quick, we have about ten minutes left. So just as we start to wrap up, I was hoping we can go all day, Jennifer. 
<laughs> it would be nice. There's so much we can discuss. Let's see. And the, so Alex uh, Fong asked, um, how do you approach the teaching of your model to undergraduates and senior executives differently? Do you find undergraduates or senior business executives more responsive to your model and, and why? Mm, both. So for my students, you know, I, I teach the model. We have exercises and so on. With senior executives, I do the same thing. But of course, I try to prepare in advance and put all of all of the content and examples, you know, uh, fr from their company into the model. So we talk about what does systems thinking look like in your company? You know, what what are what are the systems that are operating in your company? Which ones are, are working well? Which ones are not working well? You know, what are the unintended consequences of, like I work with an organization recently that, you know, they do nursing, uh, you know, uh, at home nursing. So when you send nurses out uh, to someone's home, you know, what are the things that could happen if you're not prepared with patients? So in other words, I try to take the content and absolutely um, just match it to the company's content, you know, who could argue. So they walk away with, you know, real things to work on. Um so that's you know that's that's what I do, and then when I do the self awareness piece, of course everybody's kind of interested in that. Who who at work has time to, uh, you know, think about their own self awareness? So that that generally goes pretty well. But to answer your question, the CEOs are very interested when we include we work on their content, and that's of course what I want to do. If I just talked in general, you know, I wouldn't be invited back. So. So tethering it to their real life problems and and issues they're dealing with their da their daily experiences. Um, uh, Dr. Alanazi has another uh, question. Um, humanistic leaders sometimes are faced by inhuman policies of their organizations. Um, so I guess change should start first at the macro level. Otherwise, it will be difficult to implement any parts of these model. Yep. Yeah, the leader of the system influences the behavior. You know, that's why, it, uh, you know, a country culture, you can't really change. It goes back thousands of years. It's very hard to change a corporate culture, even if you have a new leader. If you're in an organization and, and you're feeling that you, you're being stifled from being humanistic, you have to leave. Start your own company. Uh, you know, work for work for another organization where you feel more, more, uh, more aligned. There's only so much you can do in your team if everyone around you um, is, is sort of non, let's say, call it non-humanistic. I don't think anybody's non-humanistic, but we tend to focus so much on profit that we just kind of run over each other. Yeah, I would say inhumane. <laughs> a lot of workplaces are inhumane, right? Um, and uh, that builds on Jessica's uh, Coleman's question. Uh, how can we change the understanding of profit from short-term games to long-term sustainability? Um, humanistic management clearly looks at the longer term rather than short-term gains. Well, you know, I'm not an economist and, you know, and this is being recorded. So I suppose if I said, well, get rid of capitalism, uh, then, you know, I would be in trouble. So I, I won't say that, but... Um, I don't know what the solution is, but but the the capitalistic systems that we uh, you know we most of us work under today, I would say they're not they're not working. I'll just say that they're working for some, maybe the one or two percent, but for most people they're not they're not working. I mean, twenty or thirty thirty thousand people die a day of starvation, um, not because we, there's not enough food in the world, but because we you know we, we let other things get in the way. So I I think I think our systems are not working. And I propose that we change them. To what? I don't know. That's that would be an amazing conversation. And it's not yeah. about capitalism versus socialism. It's about we need a new way, a new way forward. Yeah. Well, I'll throw out one thing I'm working on, uh, which is social accounting is an intervention. Um, basically, how do we account for our values? And if we're only accounting for one thing, we value money. Um, it's not surprising that we, we've gotten to this. So. Um, Anyways, uh, it, it looks like you, uh, people are also putting emails uh, for their collaboration opportunities. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I also encourage you to follow me on LinkedIn. I mean, every day I try to post these ideas just to build a network. And um, maybe through my network, you'll be connected because I do have a lot of students and so on that follow me. So feel feel free to connect on LinkedIn. At, at my website, drcraignathanson.com, I have like, you know, 20 years of my my work and so on. So. Wonderful. I think we have time for one last short question. Um, most of the things I'm seeing now are um, thanks and emails and uh, that kind of thing. Do you have one last question, Jen? No, I think what we might do is ask Craig to give us his final thoughts. What does he want to leave us with? 
Um, it's a big, heavy question. I Don't underestimate the personal power and influence that each of you have in the world. You know, if you're walking down the street and, and you know, you see garbage and you pick it up, probably somebody behind you is going to think maybe I should pick up the garbage too. So, so don't think that you can't make a difference. You know, you, you know, as the founder of LinkedIn said, you know, there's only six, six or seven people that separate you and the other 8 billion people in the world, because you know, 50 people and they know 50 people and they know 50 people. And if you compound the math, you know, we're all connected to pretty much everybody in the world. So I guess the thing I'll leave you with is, you know, if you can be a humanistic leader of yourself and other people, you will absolutely make a huge difference in the world. And right now, I don't know how many people are on the call, but if we have 30 or 40 people here, we absolutely could make a huge difference in the world right now. And I would just, I would encourage you each and every day to get up with that, that energy, that passion, that spirit, that you can make a difference, a positive difference in the world. And why not through humanistic leadership? Thank you okay. so much for that. I mean, that's a really great way to end it because I do, for me, my practice as a humanist is to be it, <laughs> like actually do it for myself um, in the hopes that it it helps every little bit. Um, Elizabeth, did you have a final thought before? Um, no, just gratitude. This has been such an inspiring uh, conversation. And I can tell from the comments I'm seeing in the chat that the everybody uh, feels similarly. So um, thank you so much, Craig. And just for reminding us, you know, why we're here and, and the importance of just um, not trying to solve all the problems in the world, but start with ourselves and the ripple effects out. Wonderful. I'll be cheering for you each each step of the way. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating in the session today. If you enjoyed this program, we hope you'll consider joining the community and become a member of the International Humanistic Management Association at our website, humanisticmanagement.international. Uh, we're looking for people to help serve on our boards and committees. Um, it's not just a USA thing. We have chapters all over the world. So if you want to get more involved, please, please reach out to us and let us know. Send us an email. Um, or use the contact form on the website. In addition to supporting the work of the association, members also enjoy the ability to network with other like-minded individuals. You can post about your work on our webs in the membership site and to our website and maybe get, even get in our newsletter. So thank you everyone for our support. Um, our next Lunch and Learn is in December. So we'll see you there. Take care everyone. Thank you so much.